Thank you very much for for uh, for inviting uh, me. It's extremely humbling to be at at, uh, at this event. Uh, this paper in particular owns um, immense uh, intellectual debt to to Emmanuel. Um, it pretty much grew out of uh, me talking to him about his job market paper, um, kind of discussing it and kind of thinking about the results, which which ultimately led to to um, to this work. Oh. Okay, so the goal of this paper is kind of to to have to create a framework to think about optimal management of public portfolios. What I mean by public portfolios, basically portfolios of securities which which government have. We'll be thinking about that maturity structure in particular application, but the framework's pretty general to think about risky stuff, equity and things like that. And so we want to kind of think about so how those public portfolios, how optimal public portfolios should be managed, how those things will de should depend on things like agents' risk attitudes, the type of frictions that agents may face in which securities they trade, whether if we think about government debt and that has like some additional like liquidity, or convenience yields, how that should be taken into account in setting up portfolios, how heterogeneity should matter, how things like price responses, like QE types, uh, type things should affect um, uh, formation of, of government portfolios. And the way we approach it will kind of extend, develop the sufficient statistics for, 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 for public portfolios. So, so the way that kind of our, our approach will work, and it will combine the standard way people kind of in public finance and macro think about uh, sufficient statistics when you start with the like equilibrium and, and perturb it a little bit, government policies, and think about the equilibrium responses to get, to get something which has like direct uh, empirical counterparts. With the, with the small noise expansions, which will allow us to kind of use this methodology in the economy with, with a lot of uncertainty and, and, and stochasticity. So that also will allow kind of to both point out that kind of the, the key things which you kind of need empirically and not necessarily take stands on the specific model details because some of them are kind of not obvious also how to take those, those details once we start thinking about particular like um, patterns about prices and uh, of, of debt. So then, so then we'll use the, this, this, this framework to think about maturity structure of U.S. So, so we'll, we'll have the sufficient statistics approach, and then we'll use U.S. debts of different maturities to kind of think what that implies about portfolio. And there will be like different forces kind of qualitatively. Quantitatively, in the end, we'll end up with basically one force which kind of dominates and which will have like very strong uh, benchmark which kind of will, will set how, how portfolio should look like. Um, basically, what will be true in the data is that interest rates will be quite volatile and not very correlated with other macro variables. But that will imply that government bonds will not be a very good hedge for anything other than the interest rate risk. And so the government kind of would, would basically, the, to the second, third, whatever, like you, you stare at those graphs, basically it just focuses almost exclusively on hedging the interest rates. How do you hedge the interest rate risk? You basically set up your portfolio to minimize your need to roll over debt because you know you face the, the risk for you from interest rates is when you need to roll over your debt and all of a sudden the interest rates are high. So you, you minimize the rollover debt by issuing basically the, a console would be like one example of minimizing that thing. So basically you want to have longer debts than, than uh, the dura you want to have portfolio of debts which is quite l much longer than what we see in the portfolio in the US and, and other rich countries. So we'll have uh, an infant period economy in discrete time. So there will be three groups of agents, government, ho domestic households, and foreign investors. Governments will tax domestic households and spend money. Domestic households will produce output and consume. And all agents, government, households, foreign investors will trade assets and there will be some restrictions like who can trade which assets and how. Um, so we'll think about this the you know the economist since we'll be thinking about portfolios kind of securities will, will play play an, uh, an important role. So we'll think about economy with a large number of securities um, which will have some 
each sec security. Oops, let me figure out how it works. Oh. Sec security. Each security will be characterized by some stochastic deterministic det dividend process D. So bold D will be the, the full stochastic sequence of these things. The price Qs will be prices of the securities. Governments can trade at each date some subset of those securities. That will be a script G. One of the securities which we always assume the government can trade will be one, one period risk-free bond. So the price of that bond, so that's a pure discount bond, the price of that bond will be QRF. And like some set of those bonds. In, in the applications, that will be subset of pure discount bonds of different maturities. Uh, I think the pictures I'll show you, they will be capped at 30 years, but also like, we have a different version of uh, different assumptions. Uh, big R will be holding period return. This is the return on any security I. If you buy it today and sell it tomorrow, what the return you get? Little R is excess return. The return on any security I relative to the return on the government um, one period bond. So let me start with the, um, with the government. So government, let's start with the, this is with government budget identity. At this stage, this is just an accounting identity. X is the primary, so, um, I wrote the, there are like a few typos in the slide. Mark, I'll blame Mark here. He, he said that 8.30 in the morning, he didn't want to see equations. He wanted to see pictures, so like last night I was, I was removing equations and, and the, like, I introduced some typos. So I, uh, I apologize on, on Mark's behalf. Um, so, so X is a primary surplus. Um, and this is, these are the bonds the government entered. So, primary, so these are the bonds the government entered from the last period. Potential dividends, coupon payments, whatever, uh, and, and prices of those bonds. This is primary surplus. So this is what's the outgoing outgoing liabilities or, or assets of the government. Um, primary surplus is the difference between price revenues. Here it's epsilon, but very soon I, 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 it's another type which should be like script R. So, so revenues minus expenditures. That's, that's again, that's, that's an accounting definition. Everything I'll show you will be assuming that revenues are just some taxes proportional to output minus G. That's not essential. Uh, basically, in the paper, we have like arbitrary nonlinear function of, of, of output. Um, but uh, this will make it easy. So then, uh, government value of government debt. So B, so B superscript I is number of securities that the government have of type I. B without superscript I, this is the market value of the whole portfolio. This is the number of each security the government has in the portfolio times the price of that thing. Omega will be the portfolio weight of security I. This is the, the market value of security I relative to the total market value of the debt. So we'll be interested in, in optimal omegas. That's, that's our, our, our kind of focus. Yes? I guess how and G are both in dollars, or which one this is a very good question. Um, tau will be endogenous. For G will be agnostic. And then I'll, it, it can be endogenous, can be exogenous. The way we'll, I'll, 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 the way, yeah. The way we'll, we'll be thinking about government, but so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll say it now. So, so, so the way the we'll, be, we'll be thinking about the optimal portfolio. So if you change the portfolio, Something got to give in government policy to kind of satisfy the, the government budget constraint. So what that something is, you know, we'll, we'll look at taxes. So everything for, for us will be fixed. All other parts of government policy. Here I wrote real economy, so that will be G. The same goes with nominal economy, where it will be like inflation. So, so holding those fixed was the optimal portfolio, where we also adjust taxes in the background to satisfy the government policy. And maybe G is exogenous, the government has nothing to do with it. Maybe it's endogenous and said optimal, and maybe it's endogenous and suboptimal. So this way we don't need to take a particular standard with the G is. What we don't want you to kind of do, like for, for taxes, we kind of can easily think about, you know, connect distortions from taxes to things like 
you know, distortion, like what distortions are. We don't want to think about like what's the optimal path for G since it's kind of a bit less clear how to think about it. All right, domestic households. So for now, I'll do a representative household and then I'll talk to, towards the end, I'll say, say what happens when, when we allow uh, heterogeneity. So uh, households will have recursive references. So in period, oops, in period T, like VT is, is preferences of household going forward. They will depend on utility today, contemporarily, and continuation from tomorrow on. Contemporary utility, utility consumption, labor, uh, this utility of labor, maybe utility will also depend on holdings of government bonds, like some people think it provides some additional like, convenience yields. Maybe it depends on G. I'm saying maybe because, again, we kind of like, we stick it there, not because we need it, but we kind of want to be agnostic whether, whether people get some. Sorry, why WT of the of VT plus 1 and not just VT plus N? I'm, I'm, I'm so getting there. I, again, agnostic will be uh, the same thing. So, um, so, so this is, um, you can put, so, so WT is, is, uh, is, um, is an operator from, um, uh, from stochastic processes in T plus 1 into, into R's. Basically, you, you, we've got some mild assumptions about um, like, I think d deterministic variables that speed back deterministic. So, so this way we can have, we can have um, Epstein's in preferences, we can have uh, ambiguity adverse preferences. If this is the like standard expected utility, this will be just probabilities over the which states. Yeah. So stochastic discount factor will be sticking to U UT. Yeah. Um, so subject to what? Sub subject to two constraints. The, the, the first one is the budget constraint. Uh, all the assets that consumers brought from the beginning of the period, output they produced, taxes they pay, consumption, and assets they bring to the next period. And subject to this second set, and little y is like individual consumer, big Y is equal to little y in equilibrium. So, so this, is, this is my output. Um, and uh, the, these, uh, this constraint represents some sort of trade in frictions, which, which assets consumers can trade, which assets consumers cannot trade. Uh, maybe some, some assets they can hold in positive amount. So for now, this is, the, this is just like some huge vector of, uh, Inequalities that that market value of different securities cannot be not zero. It cannot be positive. It's important. That huh? The value, not the bees. Um. No. Uh, I'll, 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 there's, there will be, yeah, I'll, I'll, po I'll, I'll, I'll point out one place where, where it play a role and then we'll, we'll relax it. At this level of generality, no, because you can, you know, since this is arbitrary at this point, I can adju uh, just redefine what this fee is for this thing without Qs. There will be one benchmark which I will start where, where, where you, you'll see where it is, but at, at this point it doesn't matter. Um, so, one thing which we do allow, it's kind of will be useful for us to, to have some sense how consumers actually value transferring resources between today and tomorrow. So we'll allow consumers to trade the one period pure discount bond. That will be Q AAA here. This will be the bond which will have no boring, for which consumers have no boring constraints and there's no intrinsic utility benefit for them. So that will give us like some sense, some, some early equation for the consumers. Um, and uh, M will be Lagrange multiplier on the, on the bu budget constraint for the household. So for this private bond, which consumers ca ca can, can, can reshuffle the way, so, so the interest rate on that bond, uh, uh, on the private bond, will give the, 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 the um, expected um, growth rate in the marginal, in, in the Lagrange multiplier M for the consumer. All right.
and they will be also foreign investors in the background. I dropped the slide, but basically it will be given by some arbitrary demand functions uh, for for government bonds as a function of prices, and depending like we can vary it from being perfectly elastic, so that we're in a small open economy, perfectly inelastic, so we're in a closed economy, and some stuff in between. And so this is going back to Ivan's, uh, Ivan's comment. So, so government policy is is some mixture of portfolios, debt levels, portfolios, taxes, and uh, and G uh, government policies. So we'll be thinking about for us optimal portfolio will be portfolio when we cannot reshuffle debts and taxes in the background to satisfy government value constraint, holding whatever stochastic process for G happens to be. Maybe what, what so here output is exogenous output. to stabilization of policy either. Sorry? Output is exogenous in this. So output here, so this is, oh, so one thing I did mention. So this is um, one thing which will which kind of make our life much easier. So we'll have no income effects, preferences. So output will be function of, um, of taxes. So it is endogenous. It is endogenous. Yeah, but patent yeah, potentially little v can be changing. So if you think about you know the TFP shock, yeah. you can stick here as a disutility of labor. You don't have any efficiencies except taxes. Huh? The only inefficiency is taxes. Yes. Taxes. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So the objects, um, the main objects which will kind of show up uh, in in our analysis. Um, one which will be called like tax revenues elasticities. So this is uh, this xi, uh, this xi letter. Um, so this is how much if the government. So so the thing which we'll need to know is suppose the government has uh, a dollar on its on its uh, books and it wants to give that dollar back to the household. By how much it needs to like change taxes to 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 give that dollar back to you. Uh, uh, to households. So this is the like inverse of that. So this is uh, how much, if you change taxes, how much revenues of the government will change. And we'll kind of one over this will be if, if, if you go get one dollar of revenues, how much taxes will have to change. With, with the preferences, uh, so, so here, uh, if, if we assume something like constant electricity of labor supply, then we can get close form expression for that, for what that xi is. But but you know the, the primitive is the, the the thing in the background is really this measure of tax revenue elasticity. So if taxes are, if if there are no if if we in the, so so we'll have you know positive elasticity of labor supply. So there will be dead weight loss from from taxes. If if uh, if there are no dead weight loss from taxes, then this elasticity is always one. So then you know I change. I have a dollar. I have a dollar in my books. I give back the dollar to the gar, uh, to the households. There will be no dead weight losses. The second object we'll call it liquidity wedge. Liquidity wedge for any any security will be just you take the return on that security, weighted with the Lagrange multiply on households early equation. So this one over this we'll call the liquidity wedge. If households can trade assets without any frictions or with, without any additional utility benefits, this thing is always one. This this is just the early equation. If they say the government bonds have additional convenience, you know, utility benefits, liquidity premium on government bonds is positive, so then this thing will be, will be, will be positive. So in fact, like, so in, uh, in, in the data, you know, short government bonds are traded at, at, a, at a higher price than, than short like AAA bonds, so, so we'll call it liquidity premium, the difference between the short, uh, the short, the short commercial paper and, uh, and the short government. The, sh the, the short government bonds and the short commercial. So this is our notion of liquidity premium. This liquidity premium in period T, liquidity premium in period T comma K is accumulated liquidity periods between for K periods after K period T. All right. So those are like the main objects which will show up in, in, in my analysis. 
So I'll start with the benchmark economy. Uh, the benchmark will be easy in the sense like it will shut down a lot of stuff. It will focus on kind of some of the main risks. And then it will be both useful pedagogically and also in the end, once we kind of start to introduce other frictions, in the end, the, whatever quantitative that comes from this example turns out to be pretty good approximations. If anything, like, you'll get even, in most of the extensions we do, if anything, you get even longer duration of government portfolios. So it will be a small open economy. Um, government bonds will be perfect substitutes. And this is the, this is the part where, where, where you want square, uh, question, question clear comes into place. So, so we'll assume that both utility and borrowing constraints depend only as, as far as they concern, as far as government security is concerned, that depends on the total market value of those securities that households ha hold, but not on the specific how much market value you hold in security three versus security five. That's, that implies, that restriction implies that liquidity premium, on, we allow liquidity premium, but liquidity premium is the same for all bonds of all maturity. Uh, other than that, so a constant just of labor supply, we'll think stationary economy where all the expected future growth rates are approximately gamma at all durations, expected future interest rates are approximately R, and um, so beta hat and uh, constant interpol LST substitution, so beta hat for us will be beta times growth rate of economy minus 1 over minus 1 AS, basically if AS is equal to 1, beta hat will be equal to 1. Beta hat vector will be just vector of betas, uh, which will be used into a twenty temporal weight difference. All right. So, so how our approach work? So we'll consider the following perturbation. Uh, so we have this economy, and suppose we come to the, some period capital T, and we'll just swap epsilon dollars of some security J that government can have for the same amount of risk-free bond. Bring to the next period T plus one, unwind it. That gives us little r x, x is returned, little r times epsilon. And then we'll roll it forward for t more periods using the short government debt. So then this is, this is our net return from that, from, from that transaction. And then in period capital T plus t, we return that money back to the household. To return those money back to the household, we need to adjust taxes. So how much we need to adjust taxes, that will be one of a, a tax revenue elasticity times y. And so, so that's, that's our transaction. And so we want to kind of think what's the welfare effect from that perturbation will be. Well, in, the, in, the, in our baseline economy, where, where prices are, <clears throat> so in general, households, the households, if you think about households problem, they don't care what exactly the government does with these big bigs. All they care is like how, how that perturbation affects their, their maximization problem. Um, and maximization problem can be affected either because Taxes, taxes change or because prices change. In the baseline economy, it's a small open economy, so prices do not change. So the only thing change is taxes. The way we did our perturbation, the only time the government changed the taxes is in the very end, in capital T plus T. So then, you know, the welfare from this perturbation will be Lagrange multiplied the time the government changes taxes times how much it changes taxes times Y. So if you, if you, if you do that, that math, you end up that the welfare effect is equal to this expression. If, if, if we end the optimum, so we are looking at the optimum equilibrium and the optimum equilibrium, there can be no gains from, from adjusting this portfolio. So then that gives you that in the optimum, this term should be equal to zero for all securities the government can, can hold on this portfolio J and for all time periods over which it can roll it up, for all T. So that gives us the optimality condition. This optimality condition kind of tells us on some level what the government should do with this portfolio. By itself, it's a bit misleading. By itself, why it's misleading? Because so in the optimum, so this is the optimality condition, so this is what the government should do in the optimum. On the background, households also do stuff with their portfolios. So in any equilibrium, whether it's optimal or non-optimal household, the equivalent household optimality condition is this. Uh, and here, and, and this, this condition kind of comes because of the assumption that all the, all the government bonds have li liquidity premium. So then for us to kind of know what's, what's, um, what's the optimal portfolio, the, the real restriction will be once we take out difference this equation from this equation. Intuitively, this, this will be kind of the, the anti-chicken model of government policy. You know, um, 
here if 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 households can do something, households can grow chicken, the government doesn't want you to grow chicken because of deadweight loss of taxation. If households can trade some assets, that can, can do some portfolio problems themselves, the government doesn't want you to do exactly the same portfolio problems for households because of the, again, the, there will be just, it will crowd out those, those things and there will be extra deadweight losses from taxes. So the government really focuses on the things the households cannot do. So that, those will be nonlinear equations. So so this part is kind of standard, kind of sufficient statistics that, that type of perturbation. But you know, since we have risks and uh, it's quite nonlinear, kind of hard to think about risks. So we also combine it with this like, small noise expansion. So the way we'll think about small noise expansions, so we do our perturbation period T. So any, any exogenous variable going forward, we can write as uh, expectation times T of that exogenous variable times shock with mean zero from period T point of view. And we'll consider a family of economies where we just stick sigma here. So sigma equal to one is our original economy. And we'll take the approximation of our economy at sigma equal to one by taking Taylor expectations with respect to sigma and value it around sigma equal to zero. Uh, intuitively, it's kind of taken the, we go to, to this period capital T, we just do the perturbations kind of, we, around the economy where all the uncertainty is shut down after that period capital T going forward. Yes? If we go back there, yeah, I thought that you could already get a nice covariance expression here without doing all that. You're, it's just even nicer, or maybe if you could. Yeah, because if you do that, uh, so we'll, we'll go up, up to like se se second order. Yeah. So then, you know, because there will be some, basically you get, you get terms here, and some of them will be second order, and some of them will be like third or fourth order. And it will be just, you know, things also might simplify one, once we kind of just do the second order. Just a clarifying question. The, um, it seems like there, there must be some conditions in the background that would ensure the optimum is interior in the sense that. Yes. What, I think you, if you just produce convenience benefits, you might just want to follow up. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. On, on, yeah, on, on, on the background, yes. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so, in our in our economy, so now I'm kind of building towards kind of showing the main results for this benchmark economy, how the optimal portfolio should look like. So, to build after that, I need to, to introduce some notation. So, there will be basically in this economy there will be three um, inter, uh, three type of risks that the government will want to hedge: interest rates primary surplus and liquidity risks. So interest rate risk will be this matrix s sigma Q. This will be basically each element of that matrix will be covariances of returns of bonds, say, of duration of, of duration J with interest rates between period T plus one and T plus one plus T. Basically with a correlation of a five-year bond with a 10-year interest rates. Uh, uh, the second will be primary surplus, the same thing. This will be matrix sigma x. Those will be a correlation of returns of government bonds of different maturities with surplus minus, mi minus taxes, like some appropriate measure of surplus. Again, at, at, of all bonds, at all, the, at all the bonds in period T plus one with all the horizons of primary surplus uh, little t's. And finally, is liquidity risk, same thing, correlation uh, covariance of returns with accumulated liquidity period premium between period T plus one and T plus one plus T. So these are like basically th three different risks at three different, at, at all, all, with all the bonds and all the, all the horizons. And the government will hedge it with bonds. So sigma T will be, will be measure how risky those bonds are. This will be just covariance of returns with returns of different government bonds. One thing to keep in mind, you know, when we think about bonds, a covariance of five-year bond uh, with a 10-year interest rate is the same as covariance of five-year bond with a 10-year bond, just because a 10-year 10 10-year 10 interest rate, loan interest rate is one over price of a 10-year bond. So, so the two kind of come off perfectly. That's that that observation kind of will be useful to, to keep in mind when we think about what, what this portfolio is can can do. And so and so now we go to the formula for the optimal benchmark 
for the optimal portfolio in the benchmark economy. So this portfolio mega, how much time do you have? 10 minutes, okay. 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you. So, and you'll see like several versions of, of these portfolios, like once I start doing extensions, which will have similar structure. So, the optimal portfolio in the benchmark economy will be the sum of three, there are three terms. There are inverse of covariance matrix of returns with matrix of interest rates. So, this is portfolio which would hedge interest rate risk. Inverse of covariance matrix returns with, uh, with primary deficits. This is the portfolio which would hedge uh, primary deficits. And inverse of, of the returns with liquidity, this is like what hedges liquidity risk. So those are, those are portfolios at different, secure, uh, at different dates, you know, at, at one year, five years from now, and so on. So there are two different, mate, uh, two different parameters which weight those risks. Intertemporally, those risks are, are weighted with basically with vector of betas. So, so, so risks how my my returns can vary, how my returns tomorrow can vary with interest rate with say primary deficits ten years from now. That will be like my discount factor to the power ten. Between themselves, those risks are also weighted intertemporally with these parameters pi q, pi x, and pi a. And you know, the theory spits out explicit closed form expressions for the, for what those things are. Yeah, these are covariant. That's why I was kind of. They, they, that's why I didn't want to put, put the equations. Uh, they, yeah, they, they're a bit involved, but this is like literal covariance of returns with interest rates, covariance of returns with primary deficits, covariance returns with liquidity. Can you almost feel like the Bitcoin is like the Maybe. If I were better with continuous time, I may, <laughs> I, I, I may have been done that. Um, Yes. So I mean, that, at this at this stage, they will be like, you know, they follow some process, whatever whatever it, it is, and then once we go to the data, what we'll do will kind of impose like a factor structure on returns. We basically will construct all this. We'll, we'll, we'll go to the data and, and try to construct all these objects, and the way we'll estimate those covariances, we impose some sort of like factor structured method I VR, which will allow us to then back out the to fill out all the elements in that matrix. That's, that's what we will do. So, where we are. So, so the, optimal, the public portfolio hedges three risks. This matrix tells us how those risks are weighted intertemporally, how those risks are weighted intertemporally. What it also tells us that what public portfolio does not do. So public portfolio does not try to chase like Yields. So there is no thing like in Merton's problem. Like the central point in, in Merton's problem is like something about access, how access returns related to re riskiness of those returns. Uh, there is no risk aversion anywhere here, and that's kind of an important thing. I'm kind of going back to my chicken comment in the beginning. So the government here never that purely focuses on hedging the risks. No matter like whether some some assets look like good or de bad deal, the government doesn't take that into account in forming its portfolio. Why is that? Well, the planner is benevolent. So the planner has the same preferences as households. Say, say so suppose government and households could trade the same securities. Then households could exactly, whatever the government tries to chase some yield, ultimately it just would give those money back to households. Households can chase those yields in exactly the same way. The households and the government face the exactly the same view of the trade-off. So by trying to kind of pursue whatever, try to grow chicken on behalf of households and then giving those money back, through taxes will be will be just welfare decreasing. So that's that intuition is kind of very clear. Like if if all the securities are the same, here all the securities are not the same because there is liquidity premium things like that. But as long as liquidity premium is the same, which comes from the from the perfect substitute assumption, as long as government bonds are perfect substitute. 
for, for households, there is no additional gains the government can do by, by kind of trying to deviate from pu purely hedging the, its macroeconomic risks. Yes? Just, uh, can you remind us, does the, do the foreigners have time-bearing demand for government bonds? They yes, have? they can. So I would have thought there's also a, a motive for the government, because it's large, as opposed to the private sector, to Want to manipulate the terms of trade? Oh, 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 for, uh, for, for now, it's a small open economy, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to prices in, 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 in a little bit. Okay, so, so um, that's already I answered. Uh, to Gida, uh, we do quarterly, we'll, go, we'll take this, this, this uh, formula now to, to, to US data. So we'll use quarterly frequencies. We'll use factor structure kind of to estimate all the objects. And we'll compute this guy, and we'll also compute like each. Each of these three components, you kind of understand what drives um, in the data this uh, uh, this returns. And the key pattern, kind of, this is this is just the raw data without anything. This is cor uh, correlation of various bonds of different maturities with different mac with themselves and different macroeconomic variables. And kind of even from the raw data, you can kind of see a lot of intuition that correlations of returns with returns on government bonds they're much bigger than correlations of return with government bonds with anything like macroeconomic. So that's, that's kind of, you know, the returns are fairly volatile and they're not, not super correlated with, with macro stuff. And so once, once we do it through this factor structure and, um, and construct the matrices, so then here we, we end up with the uh, optimal plot portfolio and, um, and the three components. So what do you plot here? So on the axis is a maturity. So this is 20-year uh, bonds, 40-year bonds, 15-year bonds, basically the, all the bonds from, from 1 to like 120 quarters. So this, here, here we focus on 30-year, on using things with 30-year bonds. Here, portfolio share in percent of all those bonds. Uh, the target portfolio is, uh, is this black line. No, that is, is this line. Uh, and then the, the, the three other lines, this is the interest rate component and the uh, liquidity and primary deficit components. So basically what, what we find is that, that interest rate components is dominant. It's, it's, it's much bigger than, than the other two components in absolute size. And the other two components goes in the opposite direction, largely canceling each other. So then the optimal portfolio looks exactly like the like portfolio which hedges, uh, hedges purely the interest rate risk. To give you some comparison to, to the data, so here I also superimpose US portfolio like in, in 2017 uh, by maturities. You'll see that US portfolio, is, there is much more weight in the, in the sh short bonds, uh, much less weight in the long bonds. So, so the US portfolio is much shorter. And so, so they can stock, so US government debts are great hedge against interest rates just because, you know, five-year five year bond is, is a five-year interest rate. They're poor, poor hedge against primary deficit and liquidity risk, and the, the two other things also go in the opposite direction. Meaning, in the recessions, if you want to hedge primary deficit, in the recessions, you would like to have securities which lower the market value of your debt. But, but liquidity premium is counter-cyclical. Liquidity pr premium shoots up in the, in the recessions. So from, from the point of view of this theory, it's nice to have more, um, to have more market value of government debt to, uh, to respond to that. So, 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 so the two effects are kind of small and absolute terms and kind of go in the opposite direction. Yes? Um, the time duration and risk premium, I guess we don't have now here because of the second order approximation. Is that, is that, is that what you're saying? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yes. I'm missing that maybe like one part here that we would, would want to hash on. Yes, so that's why I was saying that, you, that that's why here I focus with go, going back to events, there is multiple terms in those things, and then those terms will come of different orders. And so, so here we kind of focus on the second order. Uh, I mean, another way to say that was that uh, so, so we'll have, you, you know, we'll, we'll have, say, 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 the upward, we can have the like, upward slope and yield curve coming from the like, risk and, and stuff, but then the like, things will start to matter, which will be like second order stuff, and then things will start to matter in the formula. It will be covariance of excess returns with those time variation liquidity premium, and that will, will end up being like third order returns. How much time do I have? Five minutes. Okay. 
Um, and then, um, how do you minimize? How do you minimize? So, so interest rates is kind of primary. If interest rate is primary <clears throat> problem for you, how do you minimize this? Well, you basically what I said. You, you try to minimize the need for you to roll over the debt. Uh, so the way you kind of try to minimize, if you do it with pure discount bonds, you try to match your when when those pure discount bonds are due to the to your expected primary surpluses, or you can kind of try to do the same thing with the console, which which kind of pays like some uh, uh, coupon, which in the growing economy in would grow with the rate gap. Now let, let me do a couple of extensions. Um, <clears throat> one, one we did a, a, a closed economy. Uh, there, in part, and that's going back to, to my introduction. There is a large neoclassical literature thinking about public portfolios, going all the way, way back to, to, uh, to the work of, of uh, Bob and Nancy. Uh, and there is a large literature there. Um, No, the, the, I we'll get to that. The, the, for, for now, there's a perfect substitute. Right, so we'll, we'll relax perfect substitutes. That will push you. The thing which, which this thing will say that that will push you even more towards longer bonds. You'll you'll see why. Yeah. Um, towards we didn't think about console, but to, towards bonds of longer maturity. Um, so. Very quickly, so, so what we know from the from the neoclassical models is that there the government can issue bonds of different maturities and basically replicate complete markets, and that's a good thing to do. But then, if you kind of try to compute those things, what we end up with portfolios which look kind of extreme. So here we took we took basically Boyer-Nicolini model, which which made this point. Uh, this is like a calibrated neoclassical model with calibrated shocks. And then in that model, theoretically, we know what, how the optimal portfolio looks like. This is the, 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 the solid line. And then you plug that, 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 that we compute it in that simulated economy. The moments use our formula to back out what the target portfolio is. So this is what our, our, our theory would predict. But the thing is, like, so, so what's, what's extreme? So here's the same maturity quarter. This is portfolio share percent relative to GDP. And you see that this is. This is like huge numbers. This is like 100, 100 times GDP in like five-year bonds, minus five, uh, five, 100 times GDP in like six-year bonds, and kind of the portfolios look, look huge and, and kind of extreme. And in short, basically, there are multiple problems with the neoclassical model. Basically, it has just wrong risks in the wrong way. What we, we, we mean by that, like what we mean by wrong risk is like, in a classical model of quantitatively mainly focuses on, on hedging the X risk, the, the, the risk to primary surplus, and empirically Q risk just seems much more important. It also hedges that X risk in the wrong way, in the sense that in a classical model has the opposite predictions from, for this covariance relative to what we see in the data. It also gets the price responses wrong, like if the government issues more debt, what happens to the prices of debt in the neoclassical model is the opposite from what, what's happening in the data, but, but we'll get to that in a second. Uh, Helen's point. So, so, so far we assume that bonds are perfect substitutes. Now, what happens if bonds, government bonds, are not perfect substitutes? So then, what shows up is this extra term, which is a vector of excess liquidity premium, li little x, which is the difference of liquidity premium on the on the short bond and liquidity premium on, say, a five-year bond. Um, and then the optimal portfolio of bonds looks like you know the portfolio I showed you plus the extra term proportional to this little x. Which shows that relative to the portfolio I showed you before, if your bond has positive A, if it has positive excess liquidity premium relative to the short bond, you want to have more of that, and vice versa. We estimated these things in the data, I mean, the point estimates all came out for longer bonds positive, but you know, with big standard errors. Uh, so if anything, those things push you towards having longer debt maturity. Why is that? Well, this is where it's coming from. The, this, I think this, this picture is kind of is telling you. So, so intuitively, liquidity premium is how much what the government what excess liquidity premium is. How much extra liquidity consumers get from holding five-year bond relative to what they do holding um, like a short bond. Intuitively, you can think about that as some sort of like uh, adjusted um, 
yield curves for the AAA relative to the um, relative to the treasury bonds. In the data, the treasury bonds kind of the yield curve is upward sloping. The, the, the private bonds are also upward sloping, but more importantly, it's more steeply up, upward sloping than than the government bonds. So then, from the point of like once we do it through, through the point of our model, it says that liquidity premium since the gap here is much smaller than the gap here. This excess liquidity premium is positive. Oops, zero times for the long bonds relative to the short. So that's that kind of pu pushes you towards having uh, long go. So, so I'll take one, one minute, um, and then and that's this point kind of, kind of if anything goes uh, the opposite from the way Treasury thinks about issuing bonds. The Treasury rationale like why Treasury issues the short bonds because they're looking like oh the yield curve is upward sloping. So, so it's cheap to issue short bonds, so let's issue those short bonds. From, from the point of view of this theory, that's kind of the wrong way to think about it. Uh, you kind of want to think how the yield, how, what you can do relative to what private sector can do. It seems like it's much higher for the private sector to borrow long relative to the treasury, so, so going long is, is more valuable than, than, uh, than, uh, than, than uh, going for, for the short term. Uh, and then, like very quickly, I'll say um, since, since that also was mentioned, uh, one thing we, we, we thought about is kind of price responses. So, so kind of the, the evidence on the QE, what happens when the, go the government is a large player when it issues bonds, um, when it issues bonds, the prices respond. How that that should be taken into account. So we, we assume that that relationship between supply of government bonds and prices take this form, kind of motivated by work of Greenwood Vianas and. Kajan and Yogo and Bruno Vianas also estimated this, this matrix of semi elasticities for the US. We derive the formulas how these things look like. We derive, I mean, intuitively what comes there, if there is price adjustments, every time you do an adjustment of, of quantities of bonds, prices work against you, so that makes it harder for you to adjust. That, that, but then if you think about that effect, that effect makes it even less willing for you to rebalance your portfolio. If the, the portfolio which hedges interest rate risk alone, that's a portfolio which is designed to minimize the rollover, the, the, the rebalance. So that, that kind of pushes you even more towards that portfolio. So then we kind of, uh, so the yellow, the, the, the red line is our original portfolio. Yellow line is what, what once we back out, like this semi elasticity from Green to Vianas, plug it into those formulas, you know, uh, you kind of see, quantitatively, you see those things not very different, all coming from, from the intuition that you want to keep your portfolio to minimize your rebalancing. So I am out of time. Um, sorry.